Dear Heavenly Father, each one of us here is very thankful for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us and our loved ones. We thank you for the opportunity to be together again this Monday evening. We thank you for the word that you have protected and you have presented and left there for us so that our minds can be fed and we can find out about your great love for us and about your plans and purposes for our lives. Tonight we bring in a very special way a request before you that we know you already know. You already are aware of the blessings that Joe and his bride Taylor will be needed. And Father, we know that being that you were the author of marriage, you are also the one that can sustain a marriage and keep it together. So we ask that besides all the other blessings of health and good travels and uh, happiness, that they will learn to know you and to have you as the basis for their relationship, a basis and a foundation that will never change and that will carry them through the rest of their lives together. As we open your word now, we ask that our minds will be influenced by your Holy Spirit to see the wonderful truths that you have for us tonight and to glean that blessing that you have in store for each one of us. We ask these mercies in the name of Jesus. Amen. So last time we stopped on page 20, 21 almost, but of course we're not going to go there until we review our memory verse, right? We want to make sure we get some exercise here to get going, warming up exercises, like when you practice the piano, right? So John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine. Oh, by the way, these are on page 18 of your book. Remember? Page 18 of your book, right there at the very top of the page. There's one and then the other one right after, okay? So John 15, 5. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do Nothing. I read it <laughs> in your lips. I saw it there. Wonderful. Yes. And then John 530, Jesus is speaking again, but now this time he's speaking about himself. And he says what? I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me, right? A very encouraging thing to know that Jesus in his nature, when he came and he lived here on earth, on planet earth, with the circumstances and the uh, problems and difficulties that every human being has to face, plus... Because remember, the enemy had a large target right on his back because he knew if he could get him down, the whole human race was going down and down forever. So in those conditions, he lived like you and I need to live. And that is by trusting and depending on the heavenly power is the only way to do it. He was victorious, he was successful. So guess what? We have the best of, of all the, the hopes in the world. We have the guarantee that we will be as su successful as Jesus was. Well, now turning into our page 20, we were talking last week about the power of God's word and how by going back to the, to the um, account of creation, we could see there how it is, he spoke and everything came to be. Let there be light, he said, and what happened? There was light. 
God didn't say, I'm going to make light. And then he went and gathered all the materials and all the pots and pans to stir it up and put it together. Not at all. That's what we do. When I say I'm going to make a cake, I have to start getting the ingredients together. Um, if, if there's something that needs to be sifted and cut up or whatever, and then mixed it up, put it in the oven, certain temperature, wait for a certain amount of time. And then there might be a cake if I, if I put the right ingredients in the right amounts, right? Not so with God. When he says the thing itself comes right out of his word. His word fulfills itself, produces itself. Now that tells us that when we read his word, when we allow his word to be in our minds, to go through our brain, to memorize it, to listen to it with care, what is that word going to do? What power does it have? The same power that brought together the world, the world's the universe, and everything that is in our planet, including you and me. Not only did he make us by his word, but he sustains us. At any point, those um, functions could have stopped, but he keeps them going, keeps them. It's like creation every day. Our very cells reproduce and are recreated. We are changing cells, not only in our, in our skin, but every cell of our body is renewed. How? By God's sustaining power. That power then, we discovered in Exodus chapter 19, as we went there last time, that after delivering the Israelites out of Egypt from oppression and slavery, he spoke to them and he said, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. You saw how I took you out of there and I bore you as on eagle's wings. That's a very powerful illustration there, right? That means you are soaring above everything. Oh, that speaks peace, right? It leaves everything behind, all the problems, all the difficulties, all the, the tunnels without an end. Everything, he carried them. They didn't have to do anything but just allow him to do it. And he did it. And so he said, now, can you trust me by looking at that? You just saw it just six weeks ago. You saw the Red Sea open and the walls of water on the side as you crossed on dried ground. Then the, the Egyptians, your enemies, they tried to follow you and then the water closed. And they, they drowned. I delivered you from the place where you were stuck without a way out. And I delivered you from your enemies forever. Can you now trust me that when I say I want to do something in you, I want to make you a holy people. I want to make you a set of priests, a kingdom of special, a special nation. Would you please let me do that too? See, God doesn't take for granted that because he did something that he's, he has a, a card blanche, as we say, to do whatever he wants. Every step of the way he will ask us, every step of the way will be a choice or else it will not be love. And so as he spoke there, Moses went told them what God had said. And what was the answer from the Israelites? All that the Lord has said, we will do. That is in Exodus 8, 19 verse 8. All that the Lord has said, all that the Lord has promised, we are going to carry on. Can we do it? Well, if they could have done it, Jesus, God would not have said, well, okay, fine. Go do it. No, he know that he couldn't. He know that they couldn't. Not anymore that they could have saved themselves from, the, from Egypt, from being slaves. Now, when we looked at chapter 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are given, we noticed that the Ten Commandments began with the same kind of a preamble. In verse 2, God begins by saying, I am the Lord of your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 
And as much as he joined that to that wonderful and miraculous deliverance, he is also speaking to us and saying, I am the Lord your God, the Lord your God, Mark, your Lord your God, Kathy and Mickey and Julie and Beverly and Janet and Del Delena and Veronica and Fernando and, and every one of us, Cindy, I am the Lord your God that had brought you out of bondage. Oh, a bondage that is worse than any Egyptian slavery that anybody could have gone through. A bondage that follows us from the time we're little to the time we die. A bondage that is within our very minds. A bondage that we have no power over. And the more we try, the worse it gets. And God sent his son and he delivered us from that bondage. And now God says, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of the house of bondage. The enemy, Satan has no more power over you. He has no dominion over you. Can I please now, can I please, please, please now continue to show you my power? If you let me, I will make sure that you have no other gods and you will not make any graven images and bow before them. And you will not take my name in vain. I will make sure of that, I promise you. And down the 10 commandments he goes and he says, this is my promise to you. Would you let me? Let there be light. Would we let God's light shine in our hearts, in our darkness? Would we let him transform our lives? And that's as far as we got last time in permitting God, in allowing God, in letting him produce so that his word can produce what his word is in us. And so we came to the top of page 21. And I'm not sure some of the books um, are have been um, improved or uh, I forgot the, the word that I'm look, looking for there. But uh, so you might have sometimes that the page is not quite the top of 21. It might be the bottom of 20. But the last time we stopped with two wonderful verses, those two verses said there, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. It began at the top bottom of 20 and went all the way to to top of 21, and that comes from Philippians 4.13. And right after that, it tells us from Philippians 2.13 that he, God, will give us both the will and the doing of his good pleasure. What more, what more can he give us, right? What more can he do? So now we continue from there. And in your books, the the paragraph begins with, we return to Romans 3. We return to Romans 3, as now this word is received not as something arbitrary, but as it's, it is said in John 5, 1 John 5, 3, pardon me. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. What is the love of God? The love of God is that we keep his commandments. How? By his love, precisely. The love of God will keep his commandments in you. That is where the love of God is. He will work in you to keep his commandments. That is what God's love is. Now to Romans 3, 19 to 22. And again, um, I want to remind you that you are all muted. And whenever you see an indented paragraph there, which is a, a, a verse, you can read it out loud where you are right along with me because we are not going to have a confusion here at all. Everybody's muted except me. So let's read together. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Why is every mouth stopped when the law speaks? Oh, because then we find out that we were not as good as we thought, right? So all the boasting that we had, I am this and I'm not as bad as the other. All of a sudden we find out, oops, I'm not only as bad as everybody else, but worse. So we have nothing to say, nothing to boast about. I would like to, to look at one more thing there. And it's, it's in the next paragraph. It says, those who are under the law, are those who think that they can keep it. 
I want to, to emphasize that because there is a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstanding and twisting around of the words there. A lot of teaching that is not what the Bible says. Some people have come to the conclusion that when the Bible says that we are under grace and not under law, that that means that the law of God was such a weight and God had to finally remove it, make it obsolete. And now, because there is no law, now we are under grace. But that's not what that means. Those that are under the law are under the law because they are trying to do the law by their own efforts. And when you try that, it's like trying to use your own body as one of those hydraulic things to put up your car. You are under the car and the car is on top of you and squishing you. If you are under the law, watch out. It's because you are trying to do it on your own. Can we do it on your own? Without me, ye can do how much? Nothing. But when we are under grace, then grace teaches us how to and does it in us and keeps the commandments. So under the law doesn't mean that the law is done away with. Under the law means don't try it on, by yourself. Don't try this at home, <laughs> like they say. Let God do it. Continuing then, they are those who say, all that the Lord said, I will do. But every mouth will be stopped because they can't. And the whole world will become guilty before God. Continuing on the quotation there for Romans 3, 19 to 22. The next verse says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. All your right doings are not good enough. It is not good enough. Remember, the law is the transcript of God's character. And unless you can present a perfect character from beginning to end, the law is not going to be satisfied because the law all only fits God's obedience, God's righteousness, God's right doing, not ours. So it's only God who can then accomplish it in us. And then, well, that's where we're going. Next, the next indented um, verse, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Pay attention to that little phrase, witnessed by the law and the prophets. In some of the other reading that we're going to do a little later, that is going to become very beautiful and very necessary for us to understand the need to have that witness by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference. There is no difference. Now, in your life, God's own doing will be manifested. There will be no more boasting. Because you have become guilty before God and you have realized that where you thought you had, you had got it right, you had not. And you cannot. But now you have yielded and that word works within you and produces your righteousness? No. It produces the righteousness of God. That is what is manifest in you in your earthen vessel. In your weak person. Here is the power of God producing all of that. So one final appreciation then of God's law. We have seen how it leads us to Jesus Christ. It shows me up, right, like a mirror. It gives me a sense of need. And now I come and I find in Jesus Christ that which satisfies the demands of the law. And then I receive that word itself, which previously condemned me. I now receive it and it itself works in me to produce that which the law wants. Romans 3.21 again. But now the righteousness of God without or outside the law is manifested. Being witnessed by what? By the law and the prophets. Look a little closer. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law now is not done away. 
In fact, we see all the way along that to do away with the law is to do away with eternal life. It will be the same as doing away with God, right? But now the law is a what? A witness. Let's develop that. I cannot put it any better than Alonzo T. Jones does in the 1893 General Conference Bulletins. This is a sermon, and I'm going to explain a little bit of this. It's a transcript of a sermon within this sermon where you see brackets. You will see also the word congregation. When Alonzo Jones was preaching this, he will interact with a, the with a congregation and he would ask questions and the congregation will say yes or no or amen or something like that. So when you see their congregation, you can be do, do the role of the congregation and speak what is in there. But now you understand what is in those brackets. So the law gives the knowledge of sin in order that we may have the knowledge of the abundance of grace to take away the sin. Then grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. And this righteousness of God by faith in Christ is our own through the working of the law. And this knowledge of sin has brought us to Christ and we have him and the law is satisfied in all its demands that it has made upon us. Now, when it is satisfied, in all its demands it has made upon us, then will it stick to that and keep on saying that it is satisfied, that that is all right? When the law has made demands upon us that we cannot satisfy by any other possible means except by Jesus Christ being present in our lives, then will the law of God, as long as we stay there, Stand right there and say, that is right. And I am satisfied with it. Yes, the law will be our witness, just as we read in the page before, right? Then if anybody begins to question it and says, it is not so, then we have witness to prove it. Have we? The commandments will be our witnesses. Now you see this, that it is necessary for several reasons that we should have witnesses. One, in our own connection and in our own personal experience is this. When God speaks and we believe it, then we know, each one for himself, that the righteousness of God is our own, that we are entitled to it, that it belongs to us and that we can rest in perfect peace upon it. There is the law and we can read the Ten Commandments and receive them as that promise. That promise that God is satisfied because in us, he sees his son and in his son was the satisfaction of the law. But there are other people continuing now quoting the, the study number 18 of that conference bulletin. But there are other people that need to know this too. Can they know it by my saying so? What does the congregation say? No, right? Just because I go and I say, oh, yeah, I'm really good. I'm doing this. Oh, yeah, you're just boasting, right? Can they know it by my saying that I assent to this and that I say that is so and therefore it is so? Will that convince them? Is that proof enough to them? No. They need something better even than my word. Don't you see the Lord has met the very demand and has given us witnesses to which they can appeal and they can go and ask these witnesses whenever they please, whether this that we have is genuine or not. Is that so? Yes. Now, you remember when we talked about the law as a mirror and we said the mirror can show us our condition, but it cannot do anything to change that condition, right? It will show this smudge over here, the hair sticking out there, the buttons not well buttoned. It can show us all of that, but it cannot help us to fix it. Now, what about the law after we have been to Jesus? See, the law says here, there's your water and soap, Jesus. He is the one that will get all those smudges and the hair and all of that set up. What about after we have been to Jesus, after Jesus is in us and we are in him? The law is still there as a mirror. And now the mirror says, you are righteous. Why? Because Jesus' righteousness is in us. So the law is 
a constant witness, a witness of our smudges when the smudges are there, but it's also a witness of what God has done in us when he has transformed us. See why the law is a very important witness? Let's continue. They need not come and inquire of us. Of course. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped one, one um, little paragraph. In Jesus Christ, I am righteous. If you don't believe it, read Exodus 20, right? That's where the commandments are. And it will tell you that in Jesus Christ, I am right, righteous. Now here again, we continue to quote from Alonzo T. Jones. They, did, they, they need not come and inquire of us. If they inquire of us, of course, we can tell them that the Lord has told us to say what the Lord has told us to say. And if that is not enough, they can go and ask those witnesses. We can say, there are some friends of mine that will be able to tell you, right? Have you considered the Ten Commandments to be your friends? They are your friends. They are my friends. They know me from birth till now. They know me better than I do myself. And if you want any more than this that I say, go and ask them. Then they will tell you. How many of them are there? How many commandments? Well, in Exodus 20, there are 10, right? 10. Is their word worth anything? Do they tell the truth? Ha, ah, they are truth itself. They are the truth. Psalms 119, 142 is quoted there, and let's take a, a look at it. I know that Janet is getting ready there to put it. Psalm 119, 142. It says, Thy righteousness, righteousness, remember, means right doing. Thy right doing is an everlasting right doing. And thy law, is the truth. So they are true. They are the truth. Continuing now on page 23. Well, then is it possible for them to satisfy otherwise in bearing witness than that? When they say that the demand is satisfied, this life is well pleasing to me. That is enough for anybody in the universe, is it not? Can you understand how it is that David says, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. It has killed him, but through being slain, he has found peace with God. He has found something which will satisfy, which will cover for his entire existence from his childhood right the way through to eternity. And now it is working itself to fulfill itself in him. And there it stands. And that very thing which slew him says he is worthy of everlasting life. This is amazing. How readest thou? How do we understand this? How have we been receiving the word of God in our lives? How? Alonzo T. Jones speaks of the last day when God brings everyone up to judge them. This is a story here, uh, an illustration that we will close our meeting and we will close this chapter with that. Listen carefully. Put yourself in, in that story because even... Every one of us is there in one group or another. He speaks of the last days when God brings up everyone to judge them. And I have to share this with you because it is so heart touching. It is so revealing of the law of God as love. And in that day, there is going to be two parties there. There are going to be some there when the door is, door is shut and they will want to go in. And they say, Lord, Lord, open to us. We want to come in. And someone comes and asks, what have you done that you should come in? What right have you to enter the inheritance here? What claim have you upon that? Oh, we are acquainted with you. We have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught us in our streets. Yes, besides that, we have prophesied in thy name. And in thy name, we have cast out devils. And in thy name, we have done many wonderful works. Why, we have done many wonderful things. Lord, is not that evidence enough? Open the door. What is the answer? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
And if you want to read, that is uh, um, plagiarizing or uh, uh, words on Matthew 7, 21 to 23, you will find that experience spoken about in the Bible. Continuing there, but didn't they preach in his name and cast out devils in his name? They did all that which the law required. Continuing on the on Alonzo's sermon, what did they say? We have done many wonderful works. We have done them. We are all right. We are righteous. We are just exactly right. Therefore, we have a right to be there. Open the door. But we doesn't count there, does it? Very sobering. Are we learning that? There is going to be another company there that day, a great multitude that no man can number, all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, and they will come up to enter in. And if anyone should ask them that question, what have you done that you should enter here? What claim have you here? Their answer will be, oh, I have not done anything at all to deserve it. I am a sinner dependent only on the grace of the Lord. Oh, I was so wretched, so completely captive and in such a bondage that nobody could deliver me but the Lord himself. So miserable that all I could ever do was to have the Lord constantly to comfort me. So poor that I had constantly to beg from the Lord. So blind that no one but the Lord could cause me to see. So naked that no one could clothe me but the Lord himself. All the claim that I have is what Jesus has done for me. But the Lord has loved me. When in my wretchedness I cried, he delivered me. When in my misery I wanted comfort, he comforted me all the way. When in my poverty I begged, he gave me riches. When in my blindness I asked him to show me the way that I might know the way, he led me all the way and made me to see. When I was so naked that no one could clothe me, why, he gave me this garment that I have on. And so all I can present, all that I have to present as that upon which I can enter, any claim that would cause me to enter is just what he has done. For me. If that will not pass me, then I'm left out, and that will be just too. If I am left out, I have no complaints to make. But oh, will not this entitle me to enter and possess the inheritance? But he says, Well, there are some very particular persons here. They want to be fully satisfied with everybody that goes by here. We have 10 examiners here. When they look into a man's case and say that he is all right, why then he can pass. Are you willing that these shall be called to examine into your case? And we shall answer, yes, yes, because I want to enter in and I am willing to submit to any examination because even if I am left out, I have no complaint to make. I am lost anyway when I am left to myself. Well, he says, we will call them then. And so those 10 are brought up and they say, why, yes, we are perfectly satisfied with him. Why, yes, the deliverance that he obtained from his wretchedness is that which our Lord wrought. The comfort that he had all the way and that he needed so much is that which the, our Lord gave. The wealth that he has, whatever he has, poor as he was, the Lord gave it. And blind, whatever he sees, it is the Lord that gave it to him. And he sees only what is the Lord's. And naked as he was, that garment that he has on, the Lord gave it to him. The Lord wove it. And it is all divine. It is only Christ. Why, yes, he can come in. And when Jones shared this back in 1893, the congregation started to sing. And I don't know how many of you know this part of that song. It says, Jesus faded all, all to him I owe. Sing. 
had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And then, brethren, there will come over the gates a voice of sweetest music, full of the gentleness and compassion of my Savior. The voice will come from within. Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. And the congregation said, Amen. <laughs> Don't you too? Why send us outside? At the gate, and the gate will be swung wide open, and we shall have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How readest thou? How receivest thou? We read it in our scripture reading. What was the word from one Psalms 119, 103, and it's printed there? How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yes, yeah, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Can you taste them? Are they sweet? Thoroughly masticated. Don't be fast with your food. Chew it. Taste it. Enjoy it. Soak it in. As God brings to you of his requirements, let them be sweet. May God help us and may, and I mean may God really, really help us to receive his word as he intends us to receive it, to do and say exactly that which Jesus Christ said in Psalms 40, verses 7 and 8. I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yeah, thy law is within my heart. Amen. Did you find the sweetest words of the title? It wasn't, you are not who you think you are. It wasn't, you cannot do anything for yourself. Maybe not at the beginning, but now do we understand why his voice is always sweet to us? Because when we understand his love, when we understand his character, then whatever he says, is going to be sweet, sweet to us. I pray that will be our experience as we continue studying this book. I will invite you now to kneel as far as possible and we will have our closing prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before your presence in the full assurance that one day we will bow before you at your feet and cast whatever crown you will place upon our heads at your feet. Because it is only you who deserve any worship, any thanksgiving, any gratefulness from anyone. Father, help us to remember these things. To have them present in our minds daily. That as we meet the difficulties of life, the continuous attack of your enemy and our enemy. We will know who is in charge. You are in control of our lives. And because we say, yes, Lord, we let you. Yes, Lord, we allow you. Yes, Lord, you have our authorization. We permit you to do all that you have planned for us. Then we know that we have the victory that Jesus bought on the cross and with his life for us. Bless everyone that has been here tonight. Bless uh, every person that is attached to them, their families, their loved ones, their friends, their co-workers, their neighbors. And Father, help us to share this with many others that they will also learn to understand the sweetest words on earth that one day when you will return, we might hear those sweet words spoken right out of your lips. 
We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.